Greetings, 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 greetings. It is I, King Clifford Jefferson, a sinner of God for the fifth kind of man, Jew, son of folk, ruler of Jerusalem. I am the reincarnation of King Edgar the Peaceful, which we know as Jesus Christ. Yes, the anointed one. I'm here today with another marvelous lesson for my subjects, my heirs, my successors. Uh, it is April 3rd, 2024, which is in the verb year 2974. Once again, this is the year 2024, April 3rd, which is in the verb year April 3rd, 2974. We're going to talk about that because it's very relevant to that. But today we're going to discuss uh, pretty much uh, what we uh, discussed in prior uh, lessons. It's the relationship between the Israelites and the Anglo-Saxon Berbers. All right? Distinctly, the Anglo-Saxon Berbers. The Anglo-Saxon Berbers were tribes that were scattered abroad, okay? And as a result of that scatteredness and the loss of our identity, people are claiming to be descendants of those tribes. All right? And this mess started with what we call the ones who wrote your Bible. All right? Yes, the monarchs of Great Britain. All right, going all the way back from King James the First. All right, of Scotland, not the sixth of Scotland, King James the First of Scotland. All right, and his descendants it goes all the way back to the Scottish Independence. All right, in twelve ninety five. Okay, I mean twelve yeah, but twelve ninety five. All right. And that was a result of the ethic of exposing of the so-called Jews, all right? Those Jews that we're talking about are not the ones who descended down from Jacob, all right? Those are based off the abstract story, okay? All right? Jacob is a surname, all right? That name is a, the name directly, let's look it up right quick. Same word as James, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Jacob. Everybody play, pay very close attention. All right, please. Pay very close attention. The name is, we know the surnames is sent it down to the Norman Conquest when we were invaded by William the Conqueror. All right, a Frankish king, a Viking, a Northman. All right, he was not of Anglo Saxon descent, he just married into the family. Okay, all right, so it says the name Jacob is of Anglo Saxon origin, came from the baptismal name Jacob. The surname Jacob refers to the son of Jacob, which belonged to the category of patronymic names. The medieval surname was not Jewish. Did we hear that? is not Jewish. Jacob is found before the conquest as a name of an ecclesiastics. After the conquest, it is impossible to decide how common the name was 
as the Latin Jacobus was used for both Jacob and James. All right? Jacob and James. We know the name Jacob uh, 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 was the son of uh, Isaac. Point seven. Jacob was a uh, uh, was a biblical son, one of the sons of Abraham. All right, and Jacob had his name changed to Israel. This is where the Israelites come into play. Okay, this is where the Israelites come into play. All right, so let's 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 reveal the story just a little bit so we can get a little understanding about who Jacob really was based off the abstract story. All right, it says the name goes back to the reign of Edward the first. All right, Edward the first. The name is also found in Spain, Ireland, and Germany. We're not going to go through Spain, Ireland, and Germany because we're not German, nor are we Spanish, nor are we from Ireland. We're English, all right? It's spelled in English. British Israelism, also called Anglo-Israelism. That's a that's a that's not true. British Israelism and Anglo-Israelism is 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 two classes of people who claiming to be the true Anglo-Saxon. I mean, claiming to be the descendants of Israel. Okay, which we know was a name deriving from Jacob. We know the word Jacob. Is a patronymic same name that derives from England. And we know England and British are not the same. Because we know the British came about with the British monarchs who got their start from Henry VIII from the House of Tudors. All right. This was the result of what was going on at the time of the War of the Roses between, between Edward the First descendants, the House of Yorks, and the House of Lancasters, which were both cadet branches of the Plantagenet crown which was uh, a house started by John, who established the Magna Carta, who was the son of Henry II, the son of Godfrey, the fifth kind of Jew, who we are the descendants of, okay? Who we claim to be based off our incorporation, all right? So British Israelism is misnomered as Anglo-Israelism because it's not the same. It's a, it is a British nationalist, pseudo-archaeological, pseudo-historical and pseudo-religious belief that the people of Great Britain are genetically, racially, and linguistically the direct descendants of the 10 tribes of ancient Israel. All right. Once again, we know Israel's name was changed from Jacob when he wrestled with the angel. Okay. And we know angel and angle and English are synonymous. All right. So we are going to know a birthright. According to earliest records of expression, according to Brackney and Fine, the French Huguenot magistrate M. Lay Lawyers, the 10 Lost Five, published in 1590, provided one of the early expressions of the belief that the Anglo Saxon, Celtic, Scandinavian, Germanic, and associated peoples are the direct descendants of the Old Testament Israelites. So everybody claimed to be descendants of the ones who are foretold on, in that Bible. And this Bible was the, is, is subject to the King James Version that was printed in 1611. All right? All right, we know King James was the sixth of Scotland and assumed to be the first king of England. He was not a uh, king of England. He was just the first king to bear the surname James. All right? In England. All right? So now we see that there's a belief, an abstract, nothing concrete, that the Anglo-Saxons which is one group of people, the Celtic tribe, the Scandinavians and Germanic people, as well as the other other groups are all, all from different nationalities, nations, countries, okay? We must understand that. The 
to go to the tennis. Most Israelites are not Jews. You hear that? I didn't write this. I'm not writing any, I didn't write anything that I'm reading. I'm just making sense of what was written. All right. Most Israelites are not Jews. And Herod believes that the 12 tribes of Israel are the 12 sons of the patriarch Jacob, who was later named, were later named Israel, as I said previously. Jacob elevated the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph to the status of four tribes in their own right, replacing the tribes of Joseph. A division occurred among the 12 tribes in the days of Jeroboam and Rehoboam with the three tribes, Judah, Benjamin, and a part of Levi, forming what they called the kingdom of Judah, and the remaining 10 tribes forming what they called the kingdom of Israel, Samaria. The British are the descendants of the lost tribe. This is their claim. All right, let's go ahead. Scone, stone, scone. The Stone of Scone, also known as the Stone of Destiny, is an oblong block of red sandstone that was used in the coronation of Scottish monarchs. Coronation is also synonymous with the anointing to christening. All right? All right? There's a ceremonial process that takes place when the king is crowned. You got the abstract ceremonial and you got the concrete ceremonial. We're going based off, we're talking about the abstract and the concrete. All right? So it was a coronation uh, ceremonial for the Scottish monarch until the 13th century. And thereafter, in the coronation of English and later British monarchs. All right? The artifact was originally kept at the now ruined Scone Abbey in Scone near Perth in 1296. The forces of King Edward I of England captured it during the Edward invasion in Scotland. The stone was subsequently used in the coronation of English monarchs and the British monarchs for over 500 years. In 1996, the stone was returned to Scotland and kept in Edinburgh, Edinburgh Castle with the honors of Scotland. The stone remains property of the crown and is transported to London for use at coronation. So they're only using something that's not there, which is called a prescription. Right here. Various theories and legends exist about the stone's history prior to its placement in Scone Abbey. One story concerns Fergus, son of Eric, and the first king of Scots in Scotland, who transported the stone from Ireland to Argyll, where he was crowned on it, was where he was crowned on it was recorded in a 15th century chronicle. Some versions identify the stone brought by Fergus with the Leal Fall Irish for Stone of Destiny used at Tara for inaugurating the High Kings of Ireland. Other traditions contended that the Lefile remained at Tara. The, the Islands of Destiny is one of the traditional names of Ireland. Other legends place the origin of the stone in biblical times and identify it as the Stone of Jacob, taken by Jacob from Bethel while on the way to Iran, Genesis 28, verses 10 to 22. This same Stone of, stone of Jacob was then supposedly taken to ancient Ireland by the prophet Jeremiah. Did everybody hear that? Contracting these legends, geologists have proven that the stone taken by Edward I of England to Westminster is a lower old red sandstone which was coiled in the vicinity of Scone. Doubts over the authenticity of the stone at Westminster exist. A blog post by retired Scottish academics and writers of exterior fictions, Marie McPherson, shows that the dates back at least 200 years, okay? So why is this important? Stone of Jacob, let's review that real quick.
Greetings to you, Council Searchy. Greetings, Archbishop Belmont from the House of Belmont, my moderators. I got a good one for y'all today. Scone of Jacob. All right. Stone of Jacob appears in the book of Genesis as the stone used as the pillow by the Israelites patriarch Jacob at the place later called Beth El, which means house of El. As Jacob had a vision in his sleep, he then consecrated the stone to God. More recently, the stone he been, has been claimed by Scottish folklore and British Israelism. Did you hear that? So it's been claimed by Scottish folklore in British Israelism, but it has not been proven. It has not been attested, all right? Other, tradi other traditions. Some Scottish legends surround the stone of scone traditionally used for coronations of the Scottish kings in the high Middle Ages have identified the stone with stone of Jacob. Supposedly, the stone of Jacob was brought to Ireland by the prophet Jeremiah and then Scotland. The 17th century writer John Speed describes the coronation of James I calls the stone of Westminster Abbey by a Latin name Saxum Jacobi. All right. So who is this James I? Is he talking about King James VI? Yes. Okay. All right. These legends also feature prominently in British Israelism, a belief system that holds that British world family is ascended from King David. From 1308 to 1996, the Stone of Scone rests in the King's Edward chair. King Edward is King Edward the Confessor, the grandson of, of, of King, I mean, King Asherton, okay? The grandson or the great grandson, one of them, of, of, of King Asherton, the son of Alfred the Great. Okay. On December 23rd, 2022, it was announced by the Scottish government that the stone is to be relocated to a newly renovated Hall of Destiny in Perth City Center, only a few mile, miles from Stone. All right. So this story we're reading. Now was forced upon the Anglo-Saxon based off the abstract story, contrast to the concrete story that was told by our ancestors. So this has to be fixed. The narrative and the narrators have to be brought to the light of the hypocrisy that they're, that they're uh, and, uh, that they're focusing on those who the light is supposed to be reflected, which are the English ancestors, conceptions of the third type of English Church of England. Why are we going to prove this, all right? So let's show how this history and this myth is shrouded in what we call masonry, all right? It's shrouded in what we call masonry, all right? Everybody know about masonry, all right? Everybody knows about masonry. We know masonry deals with what? Geometry, all right? Geometry means measurement, all right? Measurement. History of Freemasonry, the compass and the square. All right, so all you claim to be in Masonic orders, please pay attention. The history of Freemasonry encompasses the origin of evolution and defining events of the fraternal organization, i.e. a private society, known as Freemasonry. It covers three phrases, phases. Firstly, the emergence of the organized lodges of operative masons during the Middle Ages. Then the omission of lay members as accepted, a term reflecting the ceremonial exception process that made non-stone mason members of a operative lodge or speculative mason. And finally, the evolution of purely speculative lodges and the emergence of the grand lodges to govern them. The, wa the watershed in this process is generally taken to be the formation of the first Grand Lodge in London in 1770. 
The two difficulties of fiction historians are the falsities of written material, even down to the 19th century and the misinformation generated by Masons and non-Masons alike for the earliest years, all right? So let's get into the abstract and bring it on to the concrete, all right? Let's do that. Let's first start with the myth, i.e. the theories or the folklore, and bring it to the concrete where we can bring it back to the original writings or the manuscripts, all right? The Masonic manuscripts to prove what it is that we're saying. All right. Yes, if there are any questions, please bring them. In early Masonic sources, in early Masonic sources, in early Masonic texts, each contains some sort of history of the crafts of masonry. The oldest known work of this type is the Halwil manuscript, also known as the Regius Tome. Dates back, dates from between the 1390 and 1425. All right. This document has a brief history and its in introduction, stating that the craft of masonry began with Eleusis in Egypt. Now, Eleusis was born in 305 BC. Okay. We know BC is, is meant before Christ. All right. Which we call the Berber crown calendar. All right. We know when a Berber becomes king, he becomes anointed. And we know the word Christ means anointed. So when we say BC, we're saying the anointing of Berber kings, i.e. the Anglo-Saxon Berber kings, all right? Very important for you to understand that because we use masonry as well, all right? Stoneheads, castle, all that deals with stone, all right? That same stone that Jacob fell asleep on, all right? He developed his mental, the one that Jesus said, the tools we use in the workshop of the mind where character is built, all right? So the tools he used in the workshop of the mind are the ones we can use from studying, all right? Crafting your masonry, all right? So it says the document has a brief history and introduction stating that the craft of masonry begins with Eleusis in Egypt and came to England in the reign of King Asherton. And 924 and 939. Asherton was the same of, son of who? King Alfred the Great. All right. King Alfred the Great. Shortly afterward, the Matthew Cook manuscript traces Matrix to Jabal Son of Lamech in Genesis 4, 2022, and tells how this knowledge came to elucid from his from him to the children of Israel while they were in Egypt, and so on through an elaborate path to Asherton. This myth formed the basis for subsequent manuscript constitutions, all tracing masonry back to biblical time and fixing it institutional establishment in England during the reign of Asherton. All right, the first known king of Anglo Saxon Berber time. Okay. Specula speculative history. Anderson history of 1723 and 1738, Ramsey's Roman, romanticization, together with the internal allegorial of Masonic ritual centered on King Solomon Temple and his architect, Hammer Abiff, have provided ample material for the further speculation. The earliest known ritual placed the first Masonic lodge and portrait of King Solomon, all right, uh, temple. Following Anderson, it has also been possible to trace Freemasonry to Eleusis, Pythagoras, Moses, the Moses, the Essenes, and then the Chaldees. Preston started his history with the Druids, while Anderson's description of Mason as Nukites extrapolated by Albert Mackay uh, put Noah into the equation. All right. Following Ramsey's introduction of the Crusader Masons, the Knights of Templars became involved in the myth starting with Carl Goss von Holtz's wife of strict observances, which also linked to the exile of the House of Stores. Okay, did you hear that? The exile of the House of Stores. All right, and we know the exile means exposure. All right, exposing. Yes, the, the Jews or the House of Stuarts or the kings of Ireland were expelled from, from England by who? Edward I. All right, Edward I. All 
right, let's go here. So that's the history of early Freemasonry. And we know that, as I said, it alludes to stories that come from biblical abstract stories, but they made their way and rooted in the concrete story going back to Asterton. All right, all dealing with the topic Freemasonry. So let's go back to the manuscripts dealing with masonry to qualify this. All right. <clears throat> Halliwell Manuscript Regis Poem. <clears throat> the Halliwell Manuscript, also known as the Regis Poem, is the earliest of the old charges. It consists of 64 bellum pages of Middle English written and rim rhyming couplets. The poem begins with describing how elusive counterfeited, counterfeited geometry and called it masonry for the employment of the children of the nobility of ancient Egypt. Did everyone hear that? Did, we, did everyone hear that? It consisted of 64 vellum pages of Middle English writings written in rhythmic couplets. And this, it differs from the pro se of all later charges. The poems begin by describing how Euclid counterfeited geometry and called it masonry for the employment of the children of the nobility and ancient ancient Egypt. So in order for them, the ancient Egypt to have nobility, they had to employ the uh, the masonry, which we call geometry, all right, which was actually established in the manuscripts of uh, manu uh, manuscripts that goes back to Asherton, okay? They go back to Asherton, we're gonna prove it because Asherton was an Anglo-Saxon birth, okay? Asherton was an Anglo Saxon Berber. So the poem begins with describing how elusive counterfeited geometry and called it basically for the employment of, of the children of the nobility of ancient Egypt. When you're talking about ancient Egypt, they're talking about Coptic Greeks, all right, going back to Potomac, all right. They ain't talking about Shoshin, uh, all the way up from the 22nd to the 26th dynasty, all right. We know that when you get into the primordial deities, that's yet to be reckoned with, all right? But yet we're going up to time and memorial where mind and memory can remember going back to the records that were written down and laid down by those ancestors, all right, which we're reviewing now. So we're reviewing the Masonic manuscripts in regards to masonry, which we call geometry, which elusive was the father of geometry, all right? He was, the, let's, let's, let's get an idea who he was. He was Greek. Eleusa was an ancient Greek mathematician active as a geometer, geometer and, and logician. 
considered the father of geometry, he is chiefly known for the elements of treaties which established the foundation of geometry that largely dominated the, the field until the early 19th century. His system now referred to as the Lucini geometry. We already talked about that in prior lessons, measurement. That goes into uh you, you can you can discuss it on many in many in, in many areas, all right? Geometry, mathematics, measurement, uh uh science. There's many ways we can talk about geometry, all right? But for the sake of time, we're not gonna go through that. We just want to deal with this guy called Elusia, the father of geometry, which we know that's just not the case because we know that. All people of all nations have their specific calendar to show their existence, all right? Which we're going to disqualify every single one of them, all right? You're going to disqualify every single one of them using the calendar, all right? Using the calendar. All right. So he used geometry, now called masonry, to... Give nobility to the ancient Egypt. We know we're not Egypt because Egypt is your Greek word, all right? It is then recounts the spread of the art of geometry in diverse lands. The document relates how the craft of masonry was brought to England during the reign of King Asselton. So how did uh, uh, the craft of uh, masonry, which they call geometry, going back to Egypt, get to the to English? How? How did it get to them? It tells how all the masons of the land came to the king for direction as to their own good governance and how Asherton, together with the nobility and landed gentry, forged the 15 articles and 15 points for their rule. This is followed by 15 articles. This is followed by 15 articles for the masters concerning both moral behavior, do not harbor thieves, do not take bribes, attend church regularly, etc. And then the operation of working on a building site to do make do not make your mansions labor at night, teach apprentices properly, do not take on jobs that you cannot do, etc. There are the then 15 points for craftsmen, which follow similar similar patterns. Warnings of punishment for those breaking the ordinances are followed by provisions for annual assemblies, there follows there follows the legends of the four crown martyrs, a series of moral apprehensions, and finally finally a blessing. All right? You see all this going back to Shoshing. We're going to talk about that in a second. All right? Here's another manuscript. Matthew Cook's manuscript. Matthew Cook Manuscript is the second oldest of the old charges of Gothic Constitution of Freemasonry. It is the oldest known set of charges to be written in pro se. It contains some repetition, but compared to the regions, there is also much new material, much of which is repeated in later Constitution. After an opening Thanksgiving prayer, the, the, the text enumerates the seven liberal arts giving precedence to geometry, which equates with masonry. There follows the tale of children of Lamech, all right, you get into the Adam and Eve story. Explained from the book of Genesis, Jabal discovered geometry and became king, master mason. All right. Jabal discovers music. Jabal Cain discovers metallurgy and the art of, of the smith, while Lamech daughters Nama invented weaving. Discovering that the earth would be destroyed either by fire or flood, they inscribed all their knowledge on two pillars of stone, one that would be impervious to fire and one that would not sink. Generations after the flood, both pillars were dis discovered, one by Pythagoras, the other by the philosopher Hermias. The seven scientists, sciences were then passed down through Nimrod, the architect of the Tower of Babel, to Abraham, who taught them to the Egyptians, including Elusive, who in turn taught Matri to the children of the nobility as an instructive discipline. The craft is then taught to the children of Israel and from the Temple of Solomon finds its way to France and then to St. Albans, England. Atherton now becomes one of the line of kings actively supporting masonry. His younger son, unnamed here, is introduced for the first time as the leader of the mentor of masons. There follow nine articles of nine points and the documents finishes in similar manner to the regions. All right? There you have it, y'all. There you have it.
Okay. So why is this important? We know this involves estrogen, right? We know it involves estrogen, all right? So now let's go back and just deal with why this information is being revealed to you, all right? Why is it being revealed to you, all right? Let's go to the birth account. Very important. The Berber calendar. The Berber calendar is the agricultural calendar traditionally used by Berbers. The calendar is utilized to regulate the seasonal agricultural works. The Islamic calendar, a lunar calendar, is not suited for agriculture because it does not relate to seasonal cycles. All right. In other parts of the Islamic world, either Iranian solar calendars, Coptic calendars, the Rumai calendar, or other calendars based on the Julian calendar were used before the introduction of the Gregorian calendar. We know the Julian calendar, Julian calendar was introduced 45 BC. We know that the Gregorian calendar was initiated in 1582 by Pope Gregory XIII, all right? We know that the Julian calendar replaced, was replaced by the Gregorian calendar. We know prior to the Julian calendar, you had the uh, Berber calendar, all right, and all the other corresponding calendars based off the nation of peoples who created the calendars to, 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 to chart down or dot down their existence, okay, or to prove their existence here on this planet, all right? Very important for you to have a calendar, all right? Very important for you to have a calendar. Okay. The first year of the Berber year is Yenanir, which is January 14th, the day I was born on. January 14th, 1970. All right. And the Gregorian year, it will be January 1st, 1970. All right. But in the Berber year, the new year will be January 14th. All right. And I was born in the year 1970, hence the, the term Unix of time. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Unix of time. All right. So you have the corresponding months. All right. From January to December. All right. There you see it. We're not going to get to the festivals and seasons. I'm going to go to the meat. All right. Yen and there. The first day of the year is celebrated in various ways in different parts of North Africa. This is January 14th, the day was I, born, I was born on. A widespread tradition is a meal with particular foods which vary from region to region, such as couscous with seven vegetables. In some regions, it's marked by the sacrifice of animals, usually a chicken. That's not how we did it, all right? This is based off uh, what their, uh, uh, their research, my research, we don't sacrifice chickens, all right? In January 2018, Algeria declared Yen and Nair a national holiday. You hear this? In January 18th, they declared Yen and Nair a national holiday, but the Berber year goes back to time and memorial to Shoshin the first. All right? To Shoshin the first of the 22nd dynasty of Egypt. All right? Very important. You got to find out because sometimes they mix truth with lies. Okay? So the Berber, Berber dynasty, which they miss falsely called the Egyptians, goes back to um, uh, Shushin, all right? Shushin. Shushin gets mentioned in your Bible as Shishak, mentioned in the Book of Kings, all right? It says the characteristic trait of this festivity, which offers blurs with the Islamic day of Ashur, all right, is a present in many re regions of ritual invocation with formulas like Benayu, some expressions, according to many scholars, may be derived from the ancient bonus annual Happy New Year wishes. 
All right. We know you, New Year's is January 1st and the Burberry year is January 1st, January 14th. All right. And it's synonymous with the day of Ashur. All right. Now, once again, I was born on January 14th, 1970. Hence the word Unix of time. Because when we get to the uh, the calendar errors, we're going to see this reflection. OK, so please write that down. Unix of time. January 1st. 1970, which in the Berber year will be January 14th, 1970, all right, which is synonymous with the Day of Ashur. So what is the Day of Ashur? Anybody know what that is? Ever heard of that? Let's see. So we're talking about uh, Moses, the Israelites, Jacob, his descendants, going all the way back from God, from Adam to Eve. All right. You, if you look up um, uh, the Cadman hymns, all right, that goes into the first Adam, which is which is uh, uh, that, uh, 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 what we call um, illuminated scripts going back to the Middle Ages. Yes, the Cadman hymns. Spelled C A E D O C A E D M A N uh him H Y M. All right. Everybody needs to write that down. Ashura is a day of commemoration in Islam. It occurs annually on the 10th of Muharram, the first month of the Islam Islamic calendar for Sunni Muslims. Ashura marks the parting of the Red Sea by Moses, all right. And the salvation of the Israelites. So, in the Muslim tradition, they recognize what's going on with the Jews, which were actually the descendants of Jacob, who are those descendants of the tribe of Judah, which are, or which I'm going to prove, are the Anglo Saxon, and which the British Israelites are claimed to be descendants of. All right. They claim to be these people, but borrowed and took the story from the Anglo Saxons. All right. So it says here, I said, the first mother Islamic calendar for Sunni Muslims assure marked the parting of the Red Sea by Moses and the salvation of the Israelites. Also on this day, Noah disembarked from the ark. God forgave Adam and Joseph, was released from prison. Among various other auspic auspicious, auspicious events on Ashura and Sunni tradition, Ashura is, celebra Ashura is celebrated in Sunni Islam through superior superiorogatory fasting and other acceptable expressions of joy. In some Sunni communities, the annual Shura festival includes car carnivals, bonfires, special dishes, and even through some Sunni scholars have criticized some practices. All right, so it's very important to see the symbolic and the symbolism and the correlations of these practices going back to the Berber practices, all right? Computation of computation computation of the years. All right. The, the, the traditional Berber calendar was not linked to an error with respect to which years were calculated, where traditional ways to comp compute the years have been preserved. To erect civilization, years are not expressed with numbers, but each of them have named and characteri are characterizing it. But each of them has a name characterizing it. All right. Starting from 1960, however, on the initiative of the Academy Burberry of Paris, some Berbers have begun computing years starting from 950 BC. Okay. 950 BC, we're talking about the Berber calendar, and the new year of the Berber calendar was January 14th, called Gananir. Gananir. All right. All right, we know they changed it when they instituted the Gregorian year to January 1st. Hence, old style calendar, new style calendar. Okay, so the approximate date of the rising into power, part so it says the Berbers have begun computing the year starting from 950 BC. All right, before Christ. All right, 
before the anointing. All right? Because BC can be means Bourbon calendar or B before Christ. We know Christ is a name or a term meaning the anointing. All right? The anointing. Hence the word 950 BC, which is mentioned in your Bible. Okay? Very important because we're going to bring this, or we're going to attach this date to a calendar. All right? See if you know the word BC means Bourbon calendar and it means a Berber anointing. Because before Christing or before christening is mean before the anointing. All right, very important. The proper date of the rising into power of the first Libyan pharaoh in Egypt, Shoshin the first, whom then identify as the first prominent Berber in history. He is recorded as being Libyan origin. For example, the going year 2024 corresponds to the year 2974 year of the Berber calendar, which is our year. Today's uh April 3rd, 2024 is the year 2974 in the Berber year. This we know. We know this, all right? So we're in line with our ancestors' calendar, all right? Going back to Shorshin, all right? Going back to a time out of mind, all right? Time in memorial, using a Berber calendar, all right? And we know a Berber calendar is based upon the existence of the people and their rulers, all right? The people and their rulers and the Berbers were had kings. All right. We didn't identify with the term uh Egypt king because Egypt kings had their own calendar, which is called the Egyptian calendar, synonymous to what we call the Coptic calendar. Just like Muslims have the Islamic calendar, which is derived from the Arabic calendar, which we'll we'll see the, the correlative in a second. All right. So it's very important to understand that. The Egyptian word pharaoh is, is to us is a king, a monarch, okay? A monarch, all right? And we can tell the, the monarchs by their read now year of their reign, all right? Very, very important for you to understand this because we'll be about to go with this, all right? All right. Christ, the term Christ, let's understand this first. The title, not the entity, the title. All right. The title, Christ. It's going to be good. These are Jews I'm dropping, y'all. Christ used by Christians as by both a name and a title. And the title unambiguously refers to Jesus, all right? It also, remember, Christians, we're not Christians, all right? We're not Christians. We're anointed, but we're not the end of Christian following the identity of the person you call Christ, because Christ to us was King Edgar the Peaceful, who became who took on a Christ-like term, title, as a minor. That's the title, king. That's a position. Positions don't, people change positions, don't. Okay? I say that term thing, that term many times. All right? So Christ, for all those who don't understand what Christ means, used by Christians, not by us, as both a name and a title, all right, unambiguously refers to Jesus. It also used as a title, and the reciprocal uses as Christ Jesus, meaning the Messiah Jesus, or Jesus, points out, Jesus the anointed, and independently as the Christ. All right? As the Christ. The Pauline epistles, the earliest text of the New Testament, often calls Jesus Christ Jesus, or just Christ. All right? You must understand that. The concept of Christ Christianity originated from the concept of the Messiah and Judaism. So that means that Jesus and Judaism or the tribe of Judea associated with uh, 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 Jesus has some type of correlation or affiliation or connection. All right. All right. Abstract and concrete. We've been going based off the abstract and no concrete proof to validate the abstract story until now. Because I'm proving it. The concept of Christ in Anglo-Saxon is different from the concept of Christ in Christianity. 
Why? Because the, the concept of Christ uh, and Christianity goes back to the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity through the Gregorian mission under Pope Gregory the First. Pope Gregory the First. All right. We know the Gregorian calendar, which we go by now, was created by Pope Gregory the Thirteenth in fifteen eighty two. All right. He descended down from a long line of popes, i.e., doctors of the doctors of the church or church fathers, going back to Pope Gregory the First. All right. Going back to the, what we call the Gregorian mission under the what we call the Church of England. All right. We're not the Church of England, nor are we affiliation with the Gregorian mission or Pope Gregory the First. That's why we don't use their calendar. All right. We have our own calendar. All right. Whether you use the Gregorian or, or the Julian calendar or the Coptic calendar, it's all one and the same. All right. Because it all falls into a timeline that, that don't qualify to the day and time timeline, which I'm going to show you. All right. Let's get there. Etymology of the word. Christ comes from the Greek word meaning to anoint one. The word is derived from the Greek word meaning to anoint. So this deals with a what we call anointing, a ceremonial, uh, uh, a baptismal, ETC. These type of uh, 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 customary, customary uh, uh, representations. Right, let's move forward. So we know that Christ deals with it is a title and it represents the anointing. All right. And we're dealing with that individual who is anointing as that Christ, the one who to sit in that position. All right. Very important because when we we did with the Burberry calendar, which is the calendar we use going all the way back to Short Sheen the First, where the calendar was created for, they identify as the first prominent Berber in history. You hear that? Did y'all hear that? Sure, she is identified as the first prominent Berber in history and is recorded as being a Libyan origin. All right? A Libyan origin. All right? So what's the, what, what I wanted to go here? I wanted to go here for a second. Uh, yes, yeah, sure, she. Let's go here. Shoshin the first, also known as Shashak or Shishon, or Shishon the first, was the pharaoh of ancient Egypt. All right, Miss Nama as ancient Egypt. Founder of the 22nd dynasty of Miss Nama in Egypt, of the Mesh West ancestry. All right, that means she go back to Bas. All right, Shoshin was the son of Nimlah, a, a great chief of Ma, and his wife, Tenshehefun, a daughter of the great chief of the Ma. Herself, Shoshin was thus the nephew of Orsakan the Elder, a Meshwet king of the 21st dynasty. He is generally presumed to be the Shishak mentioned in the Hebrew Bible and exploit are carved on the Bubisite portal at Karnak. Okay? Let me see. Okay, so what is what is, is important is the date, okay? 943, all right, to 922 BC. So there, the the from the the time is is, is the numbers are, are counting downward, all right, instead of going upward, all right. So it's 943 to 922, all right. He was the pharaoh of ancient Egypt, the founder of the 22nd dynasty 
of Egypt. We see that. And they named the Berber calendar after him, 950 B.C. Very important. Very important. Say it again. 950 B.C. 950 B.C. We already know it's a Berber calendar. All right? You know what I'm saying? We already know a Berber calendar because we're, we're going to look at it. But that Christ, before Christ. So before Christ means before the anointing. All right? Before Christianization, all right, we were doing our own thing in Anglo-Saxon history, all right? And we had our own interpretation of Christ, which was the anointing of that position as the minor or the king, all right? That's what it meant, all right? So in the abstract story that's written in the Bible, they say Shoshin the first, who they identify as the first prominent Berber in history, and they're going back all the way back in, in, in 950, what they call B.C., how we presume B.C. to mean it, before the Christian era. But I'm telling you, the Berber calendar means before the anointing of that king. Let's qualify this, all right? I know y'all be saying, well, what is he, what, what is king talking about? Let's look at it. We know what the Christ title, right? We went through the Christ title already. So we're already clear on that position. The anoint, all right? New Minister's Charter. The New Minister Charter in Anglo Saxon illuminated manuscripts, once again, we're talking about manuscripts that was lightly composed by Bishop Ethelwood and presented to the New Minister in Winchester by King Edgar in the year 966 AD to commemorate the Benedictine reform in the now part of the British Library collection. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Let's read a little bit of it. Pay attention to what you're reading. In approximately 963 AD, Bishop Ethelwood of Winchester required the monks of New Minister under the threat of eviction to about, adopt the Benedictine rule. It's going back to St. Benedict of Nursia. All right, I talked about this many a times. The decision was made with the approval of King Edgar, who was reigning in England from 959. Okay, so 959, when he became crowned, he became anointed. He became Christ. All right? He became Christ. He became anointed because Christ is a title that means anointed. He was born in 943, just like King Edgar, King Shur Singh in 943. He was born in 943. But they named the calendar of Shur Singh back in 950. All right, BC. Let's go back and witness that again. Very important. Purpose had be right here. Started from 1960, however, on the initiative of the academic Berber of Paris. Some Berbers have begun computing the year. So that means they just started from 950 BC. The approximate date of the rising into power of the first Libyan pharaoh in Egypt. Sure, Shing the first, who they identify as the first prominent Berber in history. Hence that word, 950. On the Berber calendar, which was instituted in nine, what is it said, 1960, to backdate it and computer going back to 950, the year 950. The Berber calendar didn't come into existence in 1960, as we see here, but it's backdated to Sure Shing in 950 based off the first rising of the power of that first prominent Berber king in that year, what, 950 B.C. Berber, Berber anointing, all right? Berber anointing, all right? Very important to understand that. 
For example, the growing year 29, 24, 2024 corresponds to the 29, 74 year Berber calendar, uh, uh, Berber calendar, which is today, this year, 29, 74. This innovation has been adopted with conviction by many supporters of the Berber culture and is now part of the cultural heritage of this people, fully integrated into the system of traditional customs related to North African calendars. You hear that, y'all? Did you hear that? Now watch how I blow your mind. Since we see that it started from 1960, the academic of Berber of Paris began producing the years going back to 950, all right, with the anointing of that Libyan king or pharaoh or minor that they call Shoshin, all right, which is known called Shishak in your Bible. So he went by many names. So the name we're going to give him is King Edgar the Peaceful, okay? That's the name we're going to give Shushing and the Middle Ages. This is the same king. A thousand years. One day to God is like a thousand. One day to God is like a thousand years to us. All right? So we're going to use this phrase because King Edgar was born in 943. Shushing was born in 943. So from Shushing to King Edgar, it's a thousand years. All right? Let's prove it. New Ministers of Charter, right? The Benedictine Reform, all right? It's right there. So that means that you must go to in English Benedictine Reform. Let's get there. Somebody got to give me applause for this. If you don't understand it, then you will forever be confused. The English Benedictine reform or modernistic reform of English church in the late 10th century was a religious and intellectual movement, as my Archbishop and my Countess Searchy always say, movement is in, in the later Anglo-Saxon period. All right, so it's the intellectual movement in the later Anglo-Saxon period. In the mid-10th century, amongst the monasteries were staffed by secular clergy who were often married. The reformers sought to replace them with celibate con contemplative monks following the rule of St. Benedict. All right, of St. Benedict. In the 7th and 8th century England, most monasteries were Benedictine, but in the 9th century, learning and monasticism declined severely. Alfred the Great deplored the decline and started to reverse it. The court of Ashton, yes, sir. The court of Ashton, going back to the origins of Freemasonry, all right? Masonry, or what we call geometry, all right? All right? Ashton means noble stone, all right? The noble family, not the, the one elusive created for the so-called Egyptians to qualify their nobility because their nobility is not qualified because nobility is in Shoshin the first. All right? The first prominent Berber king, which we call King Edgar the Peaceful. All right? We're going to call him King Edgar the Peaceful. I'm going to qualify it now. Alfred the Great deployed the decline and started to, to reverse it. The court of Asherton, the first king of whole England, was a cosmopolitan and future reformer of such as Dunstan and Esselwood, who learned from the continental exponents of the Benedictine monasticism. The English movement became dominant under King Edgar, all right? In 959, that's when he became Christ. He was born in 943. He became Christ in 959, okay? He was crowned king in 959, and then he died in 975 who supported the explosion of secular clergy from monasteries and the cathedral chapters, and they were replaced by monks. The reformers had close relations, the reformers had close relations with the crown, furthering its interest and depending on its support. Okay, everybody hears that, all right? So we associate with King Edgar the Peaceful, uh, Asherton, Alfred the Great, and all the kings of Wessex with the reformation of the English military time, re, uh, reformation of of, of the uh, of the um of the uh forced religion of Christianity that goes back to what we call the Gregorian mission through Pope Gregory the First, all right, through the for enforcement of their calendar through Pope Gregory the Thirteenth in fifteen eighty two, all right.
we're going to qualify. We ain't going to just talk about it. We're going to qualify it, y'all. And go your mission. Gregorian mission was a Christian mission. All right? Sent by Pope Gregory the Great, Pope Gregory the Great, in 596 to convert Britain's Anglo Saxons. Anglo Saxons. This mission was headed by Augustine of Cattenbury, a church father, a doctor of the church. By the time of the death of the last missionary in 653, uh, the mission had established Christianity among the southern Anglo Saxons. Along with the Irish and Frankish missions, it converted Anglo-Saxon and other parts of Britain, as well as influenced the Hibernian Scottish missions to continental Europe. Did y'all hear that? Did you hear that? All right. So the Anglo-Saxons was converted, had to convert to Christianity by way of the Gregorian missions established by Pope Gregory the Great, by way of the influence by by the influence headed by Augustine of Canterbury, our church father, all right? So this is how we got into this trouble, all right? This is why the English Benedictine time reform had took place under King Alfred the Great, King Asterton, and King Edgar the Peaceful, all right? This is why it took place called the English Benedictine time reform through the new minister charter, okay? Through the new minister charter, and within the charter, it shows the Christian or the Christ title that King Gregory took. All right? I've talked about this. I went into this in prior le le lessons. So for all those who didn't get a chance to reveal that, please go back. All right? I can't tell you what lecture that was, but it's definitely in, inside the, 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 uh, the, um, the lot. All right? Let's get there. Let's go back here. So let's go to the year 6,000. And wrap this up for the people. Right. Year 6000. According to the classical Jewish source, we know that the Anglo Saxons are not Jewish, nor are the tribes of Judah descended down from Jacob, all right, who became Israel Jewish. All right, we read it. According to the classical Jewish source, the Hebrew year 6000 marked the latest time for the initiation of the Masonic Age. All right, the Talmud. The Midrash and the Zohar state that the date by which the Messiah will appear is 6,000 years from creation. When we say creation, we're talking about the creation of Adam and Eve. And we have to go to back to the origins of Free, Freemasonry or the Masonic manuscripts to, to, to get some type of percep perception of what I'm revealing to you now, all right, based off the use of the calendar, all right? So let's go back here. Uh, it says, according to the Jewish sources, the Hebrew county year marks the late time for the initiation of the Masonic age. The Talmud, Midrash, Jahar state that the date in which the Messiah will appear is 6,000 years from creation. All right. According to traditions, the Hebrew calendar started at the time of creation, placed at 3761 B.C. era. All right. B.C. era. So that means that the Berber calendar, not a uh, Christian calendar, all right? Because Christianity came with uh, Pope Gregory the First, Pope Gregory the First, when they converted the Anglo Saxon to Christianity, all right? Very important to understand that because when you're talking about uh, the Coptics, the Hebrews, uh, Chinese, everyone has their perspective calendar, all right? 
And we're talking about the Hebrew calendar. The ending of the 6,000 years marks the start of the Messiah, which will appear 6,000 years from creation. So creation started in 3761, all right? According to the Hebrew calendar, creation started in 3761. The current 2023-2024 Hebrew year is 5784, which is the year 2024, all right? If you look at the 2024, the Hebrew year will be 5784, all right? By this calculation, the start of the 6,000 year would occur at nightfall on September, September, on uh, nightfall of September 29, 2239. And the end would occur at nightfall of 16 September 2240 on the Gregorian calendar. Now we know the Gregorian calendar was created in what year, y'all? 1582. All right. So that means that 2240 haven't even got there. But if we use the Burby calendar, the year Presently is 2974. So that means that we're past the year 2240. Okay, that means 2240 has come and gone. All right? 2240 has come and gone. And we know that the end of the Masonic, the start of the Masonic year would be 5784, starting from the uh, um, uh, absence of the year of creation, which started in 3761. Okay? So if you took 3761, and you add 2024, it will come out to 5784. All right, everybody take your calculations off, out. You put down 3761 plus 2024, it will come out to be 5784, all right, which would be equivalent to the Hebrew year 5784, which is equivalent to the Gregorian year, um, 2024, which is the equivalent to the year 2974. Okay? 2974. We must understand that. So let's get these years right one more time. The 3761 will be the year of the creation of the Hebrews. All right? So that means that this will include the Egyptians and everybody because the first dynasty of Egypt was established in 3100, 3100 BC. All right? The first dynasty was established in 31 BC. The first Berber king was established in what they said, 950 BC, going back to Shoshin. All right? But they said creation started in 3761 BC. All right? And the Masonic age would start in 5784. All right? Which is equivalent to the Gregorian year 2024, which is this year. All right? And they said that uh, by this calculation, the start of the sixth down of the year would occur at nightfall of 29th of September 2039, and end will and will occur at nightfall of the 16th of September in 2240 on the Gregorian on the Gregorian year. So why is it important? Why is these dates important? Let's look them up. All right, one BC. You know, BC means Berber calendar, or it can be before the anointing. Okay? Before the anointing. We know that the calendar for the Berber calendar came into existence in what year? Nine, uh, they dated it back to 950, associated with Shoshin, all right, who was born in 943 BC. All right. He was crowned in 950, all right, or anointed, all right, because we know Christ means anointed. All right, very important for you to understand that. So we're going back to 1 BC, <coughs> where everybody can go to their perspective nations and the calendar they, 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 they use and find their date in which their story begins. All right, so let's do that. We know that 1 BC is associated with what? The birth of Jesus. All right. Annos Dominios means in the year of our Lord. Dating systems in 1 BC, modern scholars would have regarded the births of Christ to have taken place between 6 to 4 BC to 1 BC. All right. So from 6 BC to 1 BC is considered to be the time or the gap between the births of Jesus. All right. <clears throat> and we say Jesus means that Christ or I, that anointing. 
All right, not the birth of an individual, but the anointing of an individual. All right. If I pull it up and hold that thought. One BC. One BC calendars, Gregorian calendar, all right? We know Gregorian calendar was created in 1582. Prior to that, the, the Julian calendar was existed. And prior to that, uh, the Coptic calendar came to existence. And prior to that, the Berber calendar was in existence, as well as all the other calendars that we see here. Uh, on in the various calendars that are displayed, okay? For every nation of people and every people of a nation, you need to pick one. You better pick one. So 194 is considered 4 BC, all right? All right? And we know Olympe means the games. So this is a game, all right? This is a game being played on us. Everybody's in on it. All right. So I'm not a Syrian, nor am I a ballot from Balinese, nor am I from Bengal, but I'm a Berber. Okay. I am a Berber king. The Berber calendar, as we read, let's go back to it for clarity. Started from 1960, however, on the initiative of the academic Berber of Paris, some Berbers have begun computing the years starting from 950 BC. So, what were their prior to night, based off their decision in 1960 to compute their years starting back to 950 BC? Who the hell were they? All right. Who the hell were they? Because they chose a particular date, 950 BC. Prior to 1960, this date was not computed, computed, all right? The approximate date of the rising to power of the first Libyan pharaoh in Egypt, Shorshing the first, some of uh, one known as Shishak in the Bible, who they identify as the first prominent Berber in history, and he was recorded as being in Libyan origin, all right? This was in 950 B.C. So let's go back to 1 B.C. The year is what? 950. All right? And the, the calendar is what? 1 B.C. The year is 950. All right? And the Gregorian year is 1 B.C. How the hell are you going you gonna to backdate it to 1 B.C. from 1582? Because the Gregorian calendar was created in 1582. You backdated 1582 and backdated back to 1 BC. You can't do that. That's lying. All right? So prior to your backdating, the year 950 BC was already into in existence. All right? And we know that means the Berber calendar. 
all right? That means the Berber calendar. And we know that the anointing or Christ is not an individual, but the ceremonial process that's customary for when a rising power or the rising king comes to his throne. All right? And they gave a specific year, 950. All right? 950. We're not back in 950 B.C. Where they tell you going with source from the Bible, because we don't know if that's true or, true or not. But we can know there's a king ruling here in 950 BC. All right? Yes, 950 BC. Who is this king? We're going to show you in a second. All right? As you can see, in the Hebrew year, it's the 3761, or 3760, 3761. That means that the Hebrew are just being created. The creation story, the world, and the 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 uh the sentence of Adam and Eve, all that is just is just being created. It's just being created. Because it said here. In the 6,000 year, that creation was placed at 31, 3761 BC era. So that means BC. All right, according to the Hebrew calendar. So let's go back to the Hebrew calendar. Thirty-seven sixty-one, right there. But it's still the Berbers are existing. All right, in BC, because this is one BC. We're here, so that means that we must be the gods. All right, we must be the gods that existed going way back to the Egyptians because the Egyptians they ain't even created yet in 3760. They don't come into existence until 31 BC, 3100 BC. Somebody please tell me if I'm lying or not. Look it up. The Egyptian calendar, solar calendar, 3100 BC. We're in 3760 to 3761 BC in the Hebrew calendar. If, it's, if we're in 1 BC, let's go to 1 AD now. Now we're moving into the year of Annus Dominios. Because Annus Dominios means in the year of our Lord. AD 1. Not BC, but AD. The year is 951. Nine fifty one. Well, year is in the Hebrew calendar. You're just being created. According to this, ain't no human beings on the planet. All right, ain't no human beings on the planet. But yet the birth of Jesus is there in 1 BC and 1 uh, and 1 AD. And they saying that it can go back as 6 BC. Okay? Jesus is here. And apparently he's a he's a Berber because ain't no English be now you're here. You don't see English. You see Bengal, Berber, Buddhist, Burmese, Byzantine, Chinese, Coptic, Discordian, and Ethiopian, but you do not see English. So how come there's a Berber calendar existing, but there's no English calendar existing, and the Berber year is 950, 951, and at this time, King Edgar is ruling? Because King Edgar was born in 943. Shoshin was the Berber king in 943. 
He didn't rise through the born at 943. He didn't come to the power to 950. 950 is BC. If we go right here. Nine fifty. So there's so much short singing in that Bible to be King Edgar the Peaceful. All right, King Edgar the Peaceful had more validation than short singing the first two. Okay, because according to the Hebrew Bible, where short singing is mentioned, going back to the kings of England, mentioned as a Berber, uh, we see that the creation story. Was established in 3761, where the Berbers are here. We are here. Very important for you to understand that. Why? Let's move forward. Back to the year 60, year 6,000. As I stated here, September 2020, 2240 on the Gregorian year, it says the end will occur at nightfall of 16 September 20, 2240. It is in the Berber year 2974. So the year 2240 has already passed. All right? Yes, it has already passed. All right. So let's go back to the, according to the Bible, all right, and court, which is what the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew people follow, right? They're saying that creation started in 3761 and ended in 5784, right? And 5784 introduced the end of the 6,000 year in Austria in the, in the age of what we call the Messiah, which is 5784, which is in the, in the Gregorian year 2024. Okay, which is in the Berber year 2974, which we are in today. Very important that we understand that. Why? For what we're about to discuss now. Okay. King James wrote your Bible, right? And all everything we've discussed takes place in your Bible, right? We can all agree. We can all agree. So that date, 2240, is what I'm concerned about. Because we're in the year 2974, and we know 2020, 2240 has already passed. All right? Has already passed. Everybody pay close, close attention. Edict of Exposure was a royal decree issued by Edward I on 18th of July, 1290, expelling all Jews from the Kingdom of England. All right? We know Kingdom of England is associated with the Anglo-Saxons. We know that a lot of people are claimed to be descendants of Israelites that either came to be either of British or Anglo-Saxon descent. They can't be the same. Because the British and the Anglo-Saxons are not the same. You know, the British are the Scottish, and the Scottish are those who descended from the minors of Great Britain, all right? 
uh, going back to King James I, all the way up to uh, uh, Queen Anne, all right? The Edict of Exposing was a royal decree issued by Edward I on the 18th of July, 1290, expelling all Jews from the Kingdom of England, the first time a European state is known to have permanently banned their presence. You hear that? First time European state is known to have permanently banned their presence. So that means that when they say the first time, all the stuff we read about during the time of Moses, uh, uh, exposing of the Jews is a lie. All right? Because it says the first time European state has known to have permanently banned their presence. The day was most likely chosen as it was the Jewish holiday, the ninth of Ab, commemorating the destruction of Jerusalem and other disasters that the Jewish people have experienced. All right? All right, yeah, this is important. All right, check this out. All right, a ninth of Ab, commemorating the destruction of the Jerusalem and other disasters that the Jewish people have experienced. Edward told the sheriffs of all counties that he wanted all Jews to spell before All Saints Day, November 1st, that year. All right? Everybody hear that, right? Very important. Once again, I'll repeat. The Edict of Exposure was a royal decree issued by Edward I on 18th of July, 1290, expelling all Jews from the Kingdom of England. All right, this will be the kingdom of Israel, all right, or the kingdom of Jerusalem, all right? We know the kings of England and the kings of France who are ruling the kings of Jerusalem come up under what we call Godfrey the fifth kind of man, Jew, son of folk, ruler of Jerusalem, all right? And we know Edward I was the son of Henry III, the son of John, the son of Henry II, who descended down from Godfrey the fifth kind of man, Jew, son of folk, the ruler of Jerusalem. All right, I'm going to show that book in a second. All right. Uh, the Attic of Exposure was a royal decree issued by Edward I on July 20th, expelling all Jews from the Kingdom of England, the first time European states known to have permanently banned their presence. The date was most likely chosen as it was the Jewish holiday of the Ninth of Ab, commemorating the destruction of Jerusalem and other disasters that the Jewish people have experienced. Going all the way back to the Exodus dealing with Moses, all right? That's what they're talking about. Let me just qualify what Countess Sergi is saying. They can do that on their own archbishop. If they're stuck on entomology of words, they can look that up on their own. I don't have time for that. These lessons are for adepts. As everybody can see, you can see the resemblance there. Take a good look at that. Take a good look at that picture. And King Edgar, the peaceful. <laughs> 
The word Jefferson means peaceful territory. All right. The king of peace, the Christ, the anointed. I am now the anointed because I sit, I'm sitting in a seat as king or the minor. All right. Or that Christ like being. All right. Let's get there. As you can see here, ruler clan, which Council Church was making uh, was noting in the in the chat. What an ancient form of social organization reveals about the future of individual freedoms. All right, this is by Mark Weiner. All right, Rutgers University Law in Newark, history at Rutgers Law School in Newark, New Jersey. All right, he also wrote uh, on. Topics such as the black trial citizenship from the beginning of slavery to the end of the caste system. All right. So this is the my source as well as my reference. All right. This is what the, the book states in, as we can see, from kindred to king. You hear that? From kin to king. Right here. We're dealing with the Berber king. Or the Berber Christ of the Berber who was anointed, this is what we're talking about right here. All right. The ritual began when Edgar, wearing a crown and holding a scepter, was led into the abbey by a parade of white woolly clerks, a crowd of priests, in the word of the Anglo Saxon Chronicles, a throng of monks, all right, from the English Benedict time reform, all right, that goes back from Alfred the Great to Ashton, okay? who were in the Council of Sages. The issue ceremony was filled with all the pageantry of the great world, great world events in England today. The king will be anointed, i.e. Christ. Anointed means Christ, with holy oil from an animal's horn. He will be given a ring, a sword, a crown, a scepter, and a staff or symbol of his rule. For one minute, yeah. Here we go. It's all about that. So I said in the Abbey, what we sound with joyous antiphon. From first king Zodok, priest of the nation of prophets. We're going back to the King Solomon, all right? Melchizedek, king of righteousness. Malachi Zodok, all right? Zodok the priest. 
But in constitutional terms, the most important part of the British rule came when King Edgar, shortly after clerics raised him from his position of humility before the altar. For it was then that he swore his coronation, i.e. his Christ, his, his ceremonial uh, 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 representation of his uh, position in which he held. A public position, I might add. It said, for it was then that he swore his coronation and oaths, making a public promise to rule according to certain principles. All right, what were these principles? His words have echoed as loudly across constitutional history. All right, constitutional history. It didn't say religious history, the uh, theocracy. It said constitutional history. So that means that it's based upon the law of the land as the anthem of the Zodak priest, echo in the abbey at Bath that day. In the name of the Holy Trinity, I promise three things to the Christian people, my subjects, he declared. First, that God's church, i.e. the English church, and all Christian people of my realm shall enjoy true peace, i.e. that's why it was called King Edgar the Peaceful. Second, that I forbid to all ranks of men robbery and all wrongful deeds. Third, that I urge and command justice and mercy and all judgments so that the gracious and compassionate God who lives and reigns may grant us all his everlasting mercy. In modern terms, the king had plans to protect the church, to safeguard public order, i.e. body of politics, by applying the law to all persons regardless of their rank, checks and balances, and to govern according to an abstract Christian idea of justice. We know abstract is what you have now. Concrete is what I brought you because it was based upon faith, belief, faith, and to fruition. If you're going to stay in that belief, faith um, position, then you won't be able to grow fruit because the fruit only comes from the tree from which the, the fruit came from, i.e. The, 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 the bearer of the uh, fruit, the tree. All right? An apple tree don't bear plums or peaches, ETC, all right? So your surname is based upon your family tree, patrilineal descent. He swore a Christian idea of justice. Edgar pledged in his first coronation oath in the Anglo-Saxon historical records, and though it may not have been the earliest ever taken by an English king, it is clearly marked an Anglo-Saxon government as having come a long way from its roots and a very different way of life. What are the preconditions for modern Clan societies developed the rule of law. What are the fruits of the transformation? The English Middle Ages, the story leading to Edgar's coronation oath and beyond offers important clues. Did you hear that, y'all? Did you hear that? All right. All right. So we're talking back to the Edict of Exposed. When all the Jews, all right, all the Jews, I ain't talking about those who descended from Jacob or the tribe of Judah. I'm talking about those who identify themselves as the children of Israel, like going back to the British, Israel, British Israelism, going back to the Scottish kings, all right, who wrote your book. I always say, he who writes your books sets your timeline. The time never was when man was not. If the life of time a man begin, the time will come when man will be no more, all right? So we see the Edict of Explosion with reference to the Jewish holiday known as the Ninth of Ab. Let's get more clarification when we go to the year 1290, because the Edict of Explosion of the Jews by Edward I, a Plantagenet king, who we are descendants of, of the English Church of England, he did it as a result of protecting the land. By passing in 1295, the statues of Quint and Petorus. All right, anybody heard of that? You need to take your time and look at that, all right? Let's see. 1290. The year 1290 B.A.D., Anos Dominios, in the year of the Lord, okay? Twelve ninety, all right. If you look in the Berber year calendar, the year is twenty two forty, all right. 
1290 in the heat, 1290 in the Gregorian year. All right. We know the Gregorian didn't come to by way of Pope Gregory the 13th. And, and that came by way of the Gregorian mission, going back to Pope Gregory the first, uh, through the Gregorian mission under Augustine of Canterbury to Pope Gregory the first, his ancestor. All right. And we see that uh, in 1290, right? 1290 is when Edward I expelled the Scottish kings from England. All right. He expelled them from England who identified themselves with the so called Jews uh, of Israel going back to Jacob. All right. They identified themselves going back to Jacob's stone or the stone of scone or Jacob's ladder ETC. All right. They associate themselves so with, with these people. All right. And we at Anglo Saxons saying that we are these people because the word Jacob is an English surname. Okay. Jacob is an English surname. Let me show you something. Because Cyrus the Great was the one who helped free the Jews, right? We return them to their homeland. Isaiah chapter. Forty-five. Now, Cyrus the Great was a Babylonian who invaded uh, Egypt. All right, misnomered Egypt, but actually it was Libyan kings. All right, the Cyrus the Great was a uh, uh, a Syrian, a Babylonian who invaded the Libyans, who were Berbers. Miss Novel as Egyptians, all right? And Isaiah 45 lets them know that uh, God's people are known by his name. His name was given to him by a surname, okay? And we know that the Hebrew Israelites creation story started in 3761, according to the calendar, all right? And we know 3761 in the Berber year is one. AD, all right? And at this time, it's King Edgar the Peaceful, and he swore to protect the children of Israel who were called Christians based off an abstract interpretation, all right? It says here, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holding, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, you hear that word, kings, to open before him to leave gates. The gates shall not be shut. All right. 5784 is the Hebrew year for the opening of the door. All right. The judgment of the courts. All right. Two, I will go before thee and make thy crooked place straight. I will break its pieces, the gates of wrath, and cut in sunder the bars of iron. Three, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which called thee by name, am the God of Israel. Did you hear this? Four, for Jacob, my servant, sake, and Israel, my elect, I have elected, I even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, thou, though thou have not known me. Did you hear that? For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. All right? You have not known him. Why? Because Jacob is an English name. It's an English name. It's synonymous with Jacob and James. All right? And we know King James wrote your Bible, and James was the Scottish king who were expelled from England i.e. by Edward the first, all right, who who descendants were rulers of Jerusalem, all right. <clears throat> Five, I am the Lord, and there is no else, there is no God besides me. I girded thee, thou that hast known not me. All right, so as you can see in verse four, he said, he have given you a surname. It's right there, he has given you a surname. Let's go back. To other teachings. Right. Okay. 1290. The year 1290 and the Gregorian year, 
All right? It's in the Berber year, 2240. All right? 2240. The English fleet now king ruling is Edward I. He's actually a Berber descendant, but he's ruling under an uh, English fleet now gear that came into play in 1066. Prior to 1066, there was no English fleet now gear. It was not applicable because the only calendar that existed was the Berber calendar. Now, remember, they didn't create the Berber calendar till 1960 with the, with the, what does it say, the Berber Academy and computing it back, they ended back to 950 BC to show Shing the first of the 22nd dynasty of what they call Libyan Berbers. All right. But you can see the Berber calendar is existing here in 1290 as well as in 2240. All right. And the English king ruled in, in 22, in 1290, which is the Berber year 2240, is Edward the All right. So that proves not only was of the English distract, he was of Berber extraction. All right, he was a Berber extraction. Let's prove that. Let's prove that. Let's go to 1066. Can we know that uh, England was invaded in what year? 1066. In 1290 comes after 1066, right? Yeah, this is a good one. I know it. 1290. Could you want this up here? Yeah. King Edgar ruled in 1290 AD. 1066 AD, the William Conquer invaded England. All right? Invaded England. Right there. William the Conquer. William the Bastard. William the Conquer, sometimes called William the Bastard. First Norman king. Of Normandy. He was a Frankish king, a Viking. <coughs> <coughs> but you sit there, the English week now year and the Berber calendar in existence. And in the Berber year, it's 2016. Okay? It's 2016. So we got 1066, 2016. All right? Once again, 1066 and 2016 in the Berber year. All right, so let's go to 1065 and see what year if we have an English week not year. Okay, I got you. Okay, 1290. It's very important. We know the Jews were expelled from England in 1290. We know that in 1295, you had the edict of expulsion, expulsion of the Jewish king, of the Scottish kings. All right? Let's see, 1295, Scottish independence. Check this out. Before we go to 1290, let's go to Scottish. Okay, 1290. 
Bear with me, my screen shut down. Bear with me, y'all. Uh... Bear with me. Get my screen shut down. Oh, bear with me. I'm trying to get my screen back up and running. Might be in trouble. Bear with me, y'all. I think I lost you. I guess I'm gonna have to wing it. All right, so let's wing it. I think I can wing it. All right, 
computer did me dirty, it cut me off, shut down my screen. 1290. Can't get upset with it. It's just a computer. Can you all see this? Sorry for the confusion and the interruption from the screen. Uh, I actually had a, a, a broadcast to uh, do uh, Thursday with uh, Hillsdale, Hill, Hillsdale College. Uh, one of the professors uh, has some material up on the screen and pretty much all of it has just vanished. I have to reset that again. So once again, I apologize for the disruption. All right, but in closing, we see 1290. 1290 is the year that the Jews, uh, was the edict of exposing of the Jews, all right? July 18th, the Ethic of Exposing, King Edward I orders all Jews at the time, probably numbering around 2,000, to leave the country by November 1st, All Saints Day. On the Hebrew calendar, this is the Tisha Abib, a day that commemorates many calamities. They are eventually allowed back in 1685. Tisha Abib goes back to the days going back to Solomon's Temple. All right? So they correlate the biblical events or the Hebrew events with that which was uh, established by the Anglo-Saxon chronology, chronology, all right? So they're making the correlate to the, from the Hebrew calendar versus that which is correlated by the Berber calendar. Because Edward I in 1290, even though he was of the English speaking out here, he was in fact and indeed a Berber, all right? But as you can see here, Berber calendar existed, it's 2240, all right? But the English reading out here, it was the Edward the First, the King. All right. Now I had the dates up, but apparently they disappeared on me, so I, I gotta put them. Let me look, go back up and uh, put in. Uh, what was it? Uh, six thousand year, six thousand year. I hate that. Just going close down. As you can see, the 6,000 years says that according to the Hebrew calendar, starting at the time of creation, placed at 3761 BCE, we know that's 1, one uh, AD, according to the uh, Berber calendar, all right? Very important. 3761 in the Hebrew calendar, in the Berber calendar, is 1 AD, Annos Dominios, the year of our Lord. So while creation is being done and the, and the Egyptian, everybody else, who are supposed to be part of that creation come to existence, the Berbers are already here. All right. And so the Karen year 2023-2024 is in the Hebrew year 5784. And that marks the time of the Messiah, which is the complete of the 6,000 year, would be the year 2024 on September 16th. Now it's mighty strange that when you go back to 1290 and the Berber year is 2040. Look at the date. 2240, because the year now is 2974 in the Berber year. 
It's 2974. They said that the Hebrew calendar that started creation was 3761. The carrying year 2034, 2024 is this year, 5784. All right, which would be in the Hebrew calendar. By this calculation, the start of the sixth out of the year would occur at nightfall on September 2039 and end will occur at nightfall the 16th, September 2240. Now, the Gregorian year, 2240, is not even here yet because it's only 2024. But in the Berber year, it's 2974, which means that the 2024 year has already passed. All right? If we go to the 29 uh, uh, calendar, under the Gregorian year, 29, I mean 1290, you would see that in the Berber year, You see, in the Berber year, it's actually 2240. All right? 2240, and the English king who's ruling there is Edward I. All the Jews were expelled from England in 1295. It's called the Scottish Independence Day. Let's see. This is where the screen cut off on me when I want to look this up. That's probably why they got mad, because I'm bringing it up. If it's do it again, if it cut off again, you know it's intentional. Kingdom of Scotland. Everybody see that? Scotland, Scotland emerged as an independent polity during the early Middle Ages with some historians dating foundation from the reign of Kenneth Alpine in 843. The level of independence of Scottish kingdom was fought over by Scottish kings and by the Normans and Angivians, rulers of England who petitioned the Pope and other foreign rulers. A watershed in the Scottish kingdom history was a succession crisis that erupted in 1290 when Edward I of England claimed the right of appointment to the Scottish throne. The all of like, just go back to the Scone of Stone, uh, 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 Scone Abbey, uh, Jacob Ladder. We discussed this already, all right? And this is why the British Israelism is, 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 what, is what's at stake now, all right? Because it really belonged to the Anglo-Saxons, because we know that when you're going back to Asherton, Asherton went back into the manuscripts, going back to Freemasonry manuscripts, going back to Asherton, where the uh, uh, the stories in regards to the Israelites receiving the birthright from their father Abraham. All right? And, and all that story is told in Jacob's Ladder. We went through that already. I'm not going to go through it for the sake of time. But it's just a watershed story of the Scottish Kingdom history of succession crisis that erupted in 1290 when Edward the First of England of the Plantagenet of the Crown claimed the right of appointment uh, to the Scottish throne. The old alliance of Scotland, Scotland and France against English interests was first invoked at the time and remained active through to the 16th century. The War of Scottish Independence ended in a renewed kingdom under Robert the Bruce, crowned in 1306 whose grandson, Robert II of Scotland, was the first Scottish king of the House of Stuart. You hear that? From 1603, Scotland and England shared the same monarch in a personal union with James VI of Scotland, who declared King of England and Scotland in what was known as the Union of the Crown in 1707. All right? So there's your proof right there. Scotland got their independence in 1295 by Edward I. So let's go back here to uh, 1066. In closing.
We see Edward I ruled in 1290. He was claimed to be ruling under the English Rig now here, all right? 1066, all right? I mean, 1290. 1290, Edward I ruled, and he spelled all the, the Brit British monarchs who claimed to be of British Israelite descent, all right? Going back to the 12 times of Jacob, which I just proved was actually false, all right? That story was actually false because the story goes back to that which was hidden in what we call uh, uh, fr uh, Freemason, all right? Masonic Freemason. As we see in 1066, the Burberry count is the year 2016, but you have an English week now here of William the Conqueror, all right? A William the Conqueror. Everybody see that? 1066. English week now year, William the Conqueror, but there's the Berber week now year as well. The Hebrew year is 4826 and 4827, all right? So 1066, you see a Berber calendar, which is the 20, 2016, all right? And the English we now get, King is William the Conqueror. Let's go to 1065. 1065. See if we have an English we now get. Ten sixty five on his Gregorian calendar. All right. Ten sixty five. Berber calendar is twenty fifteen. <clears throat> but do you have an English week now here? No. All right. So that means that the Berber people are existing in ten sixty five. All right. Because you don't get an English king till ten sixty six. Well, William the Conqueror, and in 1290, when Edward the First comes to come to comes to ruler, they were already overthrown by William the Conqueror when he invaded in 1066. All right. So prior to that, all the English we now get were actually burghers of Anglo-Saxon descent. All right. Once again, of Anglo-Saxon descent. So let's go and close on this calendar era. Just get a full synopsis of what I'm trying to say. Calendar error. A calendar error is a period of time elapsed since one epoch of a calendar and if it, if, if it exists before the next one. For example, it is the year 2024 at per Gregorian calendar, which in the, the Berber calendar is 2974. Okay? According to the Chinese or the Coptics or the Ethiopians or any other nation of people, it might be something different. Okay? Very important. If you look in the box, we know that 2024 is the end of the 6,000 year, which starts the year of the Messiah, which is 5784, which is the Gregorian year, 2024, which is the year we see here. All right? Now, we know we just went through 1066, which we had an English week now year. All right? We went and looked up 1065, which didn't have an English week now year because the week now year was not applicable. All right? So if the English week now year was applicable, but yet we had a Berber year, and we know based upon the Berber calendar, in 1960, the Berber calendar was not initiated till, uh, until it was initiated by the Berber Academy uh, uh, and backdated or computed to 950 B.C. to Shoshin of the 22nd Dynasty, who was a Berber. All right? Prior to that, that was not known or there was no calendar to support it. But yet we see a calendar or a Berber calendar here, and not just in 1 BC, 1 AD, but we see here in year 2024, all right? It still existed. So the year 2024 and the Berber year is what year? 2974, nothing that's strange, changed. Do you see an English week now here? No. Why? Because the English week now year started from 1066 
and it ended with the uh, British League Now year. When did that start? It started in 1707, let's see, 1707, I'm not mistaken. So, let's see, here we go. The week now years of English and British monarchs are often official week now years of the monarchs of the Kingdom of England from 1066 the Great Britain from 1707 to January 1801 and the United Kingdom since January 1801. Let me read that again. The week now years of the English and British monarchs are the official week now years of the monarchs of the Kingdom of England from 1066. What about from 1065? Who were they? They weren't English nor British. They were Berbers. All right? We just seen the calendar. Let's go back. Right here. You don't see English week now year here. You see a Berber calendar and you see a British calendar. The British week now year started in what they said, 1707. The Berber calendar existed prior to 1066. All right? And we know that in 1960, the uh, Berber Academy backdated it or computed it to backdate Shoshin, who was born in 943, but became the Libyan crown king in 950. The same 950 BC we see when we look up the Gregorian year 1 BC or 1 AD. All right? It's still 950, 950 uh, 1, which is AD, because AD means what? Annos Dominios in the year of our Lord. All right? So we see all the calendars here. From alphabetical order, all right? Every nation, you better pick one because according to the Hebrew calendar, time is up. 5784, creation started in 3761, all right? So let's close out on this. You have the Assyrians, Olympics, dating, we know that means games, indiction cycle, everybody needs to look this up on their own time. Seleucid era, ancient Roman era, the Maya era, the Christian era. All right, as you can see, the Christian era goes right here. Common era down is at 1 BC. Annus Dominios. Right here. AD, Latin Annus Dominios, meaning the year of our Lord. So that can only be 1 BC or 1 AD, and 1 AD in the, in the Gregorian year, in the Berber year, is 950. Okay? Down in Syria, Islamic, Hindu, Southern Asia, by Jewish, as you can see, AM, what that means. Let's put this up before we close out. Any or moon, moon, moon day. So ain't no mistaken about what I'm saying to y'all. Any or moon day, abbreviated AM or A dot M dot or year after creation is a calendar error based on the biblical account of creation of the world. In subsequently history, two such calendar errors have such notably used historically. Since the Middle Ages, since the Middle Ages, the Hebrew calendar has been based on rabbinic calculations of the year of the creation from the Hebrew Masoretic text of the Bible. This calendar is used within Jewish communities for religious purposes in one of two official calendars of Israel. And the Hebrew calendar is the day of being, being beginning at sunset. All right, all that is, is relevant. All right, so as we can see, Endless Moon Day means starting from the day after creation, and the day after creation is 3761. Because it said here, AM for Latin, and those means, means in the year of the world, has its epoch in the year 3761 BC. 
It was first used to number the years of the Mali Hebrew calendars in 1178 by Men Menumid. All right? A Sephardic, a Sephardic Arabic, one of them. Then you have the Rosfianism, ETC. All right? So once again, Hebrews or Jews from the tribe of Judah or descended from Jacob or Abraham, Egyptians, uh, uh, I don't care what you call yourself, now, back then, now, or in the future, you better fit within this timeline of this calendar, starting from the creation of the world in 3761 BC to the ending of that creation, which was 5784, according to the Hebrew calendar, which is in the Hebrew calendar, the year 2024, which is the year you're in now, which according to us as Berbers is 2974. So let me just go to 1B, 1AD real quick again, just to show you before we close out. Once again, I'm sorry for the interruption of the, uh, uh, the sites that I had pulled up. I guess it just was an overload, so call yourself for that. Here we go again. One AD, Annos Dominios. Annos Dominus means in the year of our Lord. All right. Let's do 1 BC, just so we can keep it in the BC era, Burby County. All right. One BC is the year 950. Everybody see it, right? 950. We know that, once again, according to the Berber calendar, the Berber calendar was started by the Berber Academy of, 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 of Paris, which designated the date, computing back to the Berber calendar, computed back to Shoshin, which is only Shishak in the Bible, going back to 950 B.C. So you're looking at 1 B.C. in the Gregorian year and the Berber calendar, 950 B.C. BC. So if this is the case, then that means that King Ego the Peaceful will actually be Shoshin, the one you have in the Bible. Okay? That's who that person would actually be. Once again, 950 in the Berber year is actually 1 BC. And in the Hebrew calendar year, that will be 3761, the beginning of the creation of the world. Annuals, minials, however they pronounce that. All right. So the calendar don't lie. The calendar does not lie. And we know in 1 BC was the day of who? Jesus Christ. And King Edgar was living at that time because he was called um, uh, the Christ consciousness. All right. He had the consciousness of the anointing. Of, of why he was in that position. All right? Everybody needs to understand that. And that's why many people can't teach it because they don't understand it. So in closing, I hope it was not confusing to you. I hope that the calendar made sense. Uh, all those who got a chance to view this or who have not, please go back and review the calendar and start with the calendar error. error. Because every nation from every country that has the people of that nation must have a calendar to validate their existence. Because as I always say, he who writes your books sets your timeline. The Berber calendar was created in 1960 for the, by the uh, uh, Academic Berber Academy in, uh, per, in, in Paris uh, and computed it to reference the date in lieu of Shoshim, the Berber king, who was the first monarch of the Berber dynasty, which was the 22nd dynasty of what they misnomer as being Egypt, all right? And we know under Masonic manuscripts, under the history regarding Freemasonry, all that history that was told in regards to uh, history building 
uh, concerning geometry, which is we know it today as masonry, actually started in the Middle Ages. So with that, here we at the 13th English Church say peace.